Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as as already said, I'm Bob Blatchford from Open Forum Europe. Uh, I've been asked to talk this morning on measuring openness and opening public procurement. Also, just during discussion at dinner last night, Christians asked me to talk a bit about the UK government and what's going on over there at the moment, which I'll add at the end of the presentation. Well, first of all, uh, as you realize I'm English, I do have a tendency to talk too quickly. So if any, if any time I'm talking too quickly, just put your hand up and I'll slow down. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about is why is openness important? A little bit about uh, the changing marketplace, but actually very little about that. Talk about what is openness. Um, look at how you measure that and why it's important you measure openness. Then look at uh, the implementation openness, and we particularly believe procurement is the only way you're going to implement openness across Europe. And finally, I'll talk a bit about the UK government strategy. Um, oh, before I do that, sorry, I uh, ought to explain who Open Forum Europe are. <laughs> um, Open Forum Europe uh, has a mission to encourage uh, open competitive IT. So what we're trying to do is to ensure that companies have got a free and open opportunity to compete in the European marketplace. Uh, we are a member company and we are sponsored by our members such as Red Hat, IBM, uh, Google, Oracle, etc. Uh, we also have a large number of national partners across Europe who we work with to develop our policy that we present to the Commission. Uh, we mostly operate in Brussels, operating with the Commission and with the Parliament, um, looking at the policy issues, looking at the legislation to uh, identify how things need to be changed for the future. So why is openness important? Well, re research is telling us that 90% of the public sector are locked in to their IT services today. This is obviously limiting competitiveness for those public services. Uh, I would add the figures that I will quote today are from uh, research that we've carried out across the European community. So um, there are obviously differences in different countries, but overall we're looking at a very uncompetitive situation. Uh, and that lock-in results from a number of um, issues. You know, there's the simple lock-in because you've got a single supplier, a single vendor situation. Uh, the lock-in can be because, because of proprietary standards that have been implemented. So you've not got the opportunity to, to swap products. And uh, lock-in can occur through the use of traditional procurement mechanisms. Like you're just doing the same old thing repeating what you did before. I'm not going to talk about products, because uh, everyone puts a slide up about all the masses of open source products uh, around today. Really, the only point I want to make is that we're seeing a rapidly increasing number of business models being introduced into the market, and new products and new ideas, um, especially the development of cloud computing and cloud services. If you want to take advantage of these new business models and new services, then you've got to be free from lock-in. You've got to be able to have transferability between your products. What is openness? Well, we would de describe open as being something that gives you a free and fair com competition uh, and that you're totally free from vendor lock-in and that you've got the opportunity to substitute product for product within your software portfolio. Uh. One of the important things that we are seeing is that people don't understand how they're locked in. So one of the important components that we've been looking at is how you measure openness. 
so that people can judge the situation within their own IT shop. And uh, typically, lock-ins occur in things like the use of undocumented protocols, uh, depend dependence on quite often on undocumented data formats within software that you've got implemented in your, in your shop. And quite often, you find a reliance on extensions beyond the standard, outside of, of, of international standards, a number of suppliers will provide you with extensions to enable you to do uh, new and better things. But since they don't comply with the standards, you're immediately outside and locked out of any other future changes. And quite often you're seeing restrictive patents, restrictive standards based on patents. There is also the situation where you can get consequential lock-in. This is where the product only runs in a single hardware environment or a single software environment, and, or you're dependent on other services provided through a software supplier. And it's product-dependent data formats and product-dependent user specifications are also other consequential ways of gaining locking. Now, this locking can occur at many levels. Um, from the client through to the business level within the uh, organization. And you know, client lock-in can be where people are developing specific macros dependent on features in that particular product. You know, uh, software lock-in lock I've alluded to already, uh, where you are actually using products which only run in one software environment. Hardware lock-in is something that we're seeing more and more of these days with uh, products, a good example I suppose being Apple and its product range, where you lock into a complete Apple environment, and so can't transfer those applications from that environment easily into other environments. Data lock-in is becoming more prevalent within the um, cloud computing environment, where you're seeing people uh, investing in services in the cloud, and then not actually looking at how they're going to uh, transfer those services if that service provider becomes uneconomic or that service provider no longer is in business. How do you take that set of data and move it from supplier one to supplier two? That has a consequential um, occurrence as well because it's not just the data that becomes a major issue of lock-in in that position. It's also the definitions of that data, the user definitions, the procedures, the uh, security around that data as well that needs to be transferred. <laughs> And finally, business lock-in. Business lock-in is about licensing and the licensing models that lock you into the future. We uh, worked with the UK government for about, about six years ago now to uh, define a set of standards that um, procurers could use and apply when they're purchasing software to identify if there was a, a potential for lock-in in the way they were moving forward. And the idea was to, you know, as it says here, evaluate technical and commercial lock-in and promote fair competition in the marketplace. So what we tried to do with the program was to actually ensure that procurement decisions taken are taken from an open standards point of view and that uh, managers know how and what risks they're taking when they actually make those decisions. So the Certified Open Program is a framework that measures the freedom of competition within the environment. Um, products then can be evaluated against that framework in terms of the amount of lock-in they occur when deployed by the user. And so we define open within this context to mean freedom from vendor lock-in and open, openness to substitution by competing products. And that's the important thing, the ability to substitute with competing products. What sort of questions do we ask when we're looking at this framework and uh, trying to measure lock-in? Well, the example, the, I'll give three examples of the sort of questions that are asked within this framework. One, does the product enable the user to substitute devices? And today, Actually, if you look at a 
a lot of software products, there's very few that do allow you to do that. Uh, the very good example today is uh, web standards, which do allow proper substitution of product and, and devices. Does the product offer its full use of functionality while conforming only to the open standard with no restrictions or extensions? That's, uh, user functionality is very important to users today, and it's very easy for people to be sucked in to additional functionality that's provided outside of an open standards environment. So it's very important that this question is examined properly when you're looking at user software for the future. And I alluded to earlier about the business locking. Are there any licensing contracts uh, agreements that would limit the use of substitute, substitute, oh, sorry, <laughs> substitutability? A good example here is the, the fact that there can be binding support contracts that restrict the user's ability to actually deploy, deploy product or extend product. Um, I'm not going to cover open source today um, because we don't actually promote open source. Um, the only reason I put it here. Uh, we promote open standards. We promote interoperability. Um, because we find that a far better agenda to promote to government and business. They understand the issues around open standards. They understand the issues around interoperability. Uh, governments and businesses don't normally understand the issues around open source. But by promoting an open standards and an open interoperability agenda, uh, people move to the obvious conclusion that open source is what's required to deliver that agenda. What do we mean by open standards? We mean that formats that are subject to full public assessment, that there's no dependencies on proprietary formats, that it's free from legal limits, and it's independent of a single vendor and available to all. To us, to us that's very important, that definition of open standards, because that's what we take forward in our uh, proposals to government. But what we're seeing a lot of now within the public sector is the demand by the public for more open data. Open data is really the public's ability to get access to its own data in a free and fair format, of not being forced into any particular proprietary software or hardware to have their access to that data. So alongside that open data is the open access um, view. It's very important across Europe that citizens are allowed access to the data and allowed access to the data uh, in any way that they can, they can not being forced through using uh, a Windows browser or using a particular um, uh, video uh, streaming software. I mean, a good example here is that the uh, European Commission still distributes its uh, video, um, videoing of the uh, daily sort of uh, activities of the Commission using a Windows only uh, capability. And so this is not a free and open access to citizens. <laughs> okay. We believe that to implement open source, open standards, it's important that it becomes part of the procurement process within an organization, a public organization or a business organization. And what open procurement does, it enables um, accountability and transparency. And without accountability and transparency, then you're, you're losing, you lose the plot with um, implementation of, of open standards and open source. It's too easy for the purchaser to actually uh, tender 
for products which are closed proprietary. So without that transparency, minimizes competition. And what we're out to do is to try and improve the position, particularly for the SMEs, because we're seeing across Europe that SMEs are not getting a fair chance to tender for, for procurements. And in particular, the SMEs are forced into uh, tendering where they do tender within a proprietary env environment and not allowed to use, or, n or not encouraged, sorry, to use new innovative techniques and new software. We have been looking at public procurement in the EU. The important issue about ICT public procurement is that the EU market accounts for about 19.5% of gross domestic product. So that's an immense amount of money being spent across the EU on ICT purchasing. We look at um, ICT purchasing across the EU on an annual basis to review what's happening. Uh, we, look at, we do a, a, an annual monitoring exercise of the Tenders Electronic Daily Database that the uh, EU provides. Uh, it's a very limited exercise, I would point out, because we haven't got a great number of resources. Um, so we actually limit our monitoring to only looking at Latin alphabet tenders. Uh, the tender database only actually records details of tenders above the EU thresh threshold, which is about 150,000 euros. Um, and as it says here, that um, that actually only accounts for about a total of about 18% of the total purchasing across Europe. And we look at a three-month snapshot. What we look for is discriminatory wording within tenders. Uh, what we see, there is, there is um, specific EU legislation that states that tenderers should not include trademarks within their tenders. So we look for that one item within tenders, the mention of trademarks. What we're looking at is there's a, um, a f about a 400 billion euro value of tenders within that uh, published. And what we've seen, this is a good example of the range of use of, mic uh, sorry, I can say, drop into using the word Microsoft, I didn't mean to. <laughs> the, the, the range of trademarks used within tenders across Europe. And you can see here that uh, there is one proprietary software provider that actually is quoted more often in tenders than any other. One of the interesting things that we've seen happen is that uh, at the end of 2009, the EU introduced a new remedies directive that actually uh, changed the legal standing uh, of uh, complaints which had to be dealt locally, dealt with locally across the EU, which meant that the uh, commissioning authorities were liable if they actually um, issued tenders that were illegal. So when we looked at the situation in 2008, um, then over 80% were tendered on an open basis. Now. According to EU regulations, the majority of tenders should be open and not through any special negotiated procedures. What we've seen in the last two years is the reduction of open procedures for tenders and an increase in special procedures. Now, special procedures enable uh, an organization to tender in a restrictive way, either by selecting the uh, respondents that they want to use or going for some preliminary tendering process. So that is actually changing the, the dimensions. What we found when we've done this analysis 
is that in 2008-2009, we were 22-25% of tenders included trademarks. In 2010, that went down to 13%. Now, that sounds good, <laughs> except for two factors. One, the number of tenders went up dramatically in 2010 as a res uh, response to the uh, directive. But we've also seen about 6% of tenders moving out of open into closed procedures, which we are not able to monitor. So we're very concerned about what's happening. Uh, the other thing we noticed in 2010 is a lot of tenderers moved to uh, more generic tendering. So rather than saying uh, we're looking for an office suite that provides specific uh, word processing, specific um, 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 database, etc., it just says we generically are looking to tender for software to support our organization. So it's getting away from any specifics at all. We're putting some recommendations together for the EU, um, but these conclusions probably uh, will do for today's presentation. That we believe that if, if we went down a bit deeper within the tendering process, that we would find a lot more discrimination and, and discriminatory uh, techniques. We believe that public procurement directives, the changes to public procurement directives, indicate that they actually do work. Like the, the, um, the change in directives have actually had an immediate effect on the process. Although, whether that's, uh, in some cases that's good, in some cases it's bad. Such practices uh, are not, against, not only against the principles of competition, but also an obstacle for, to SMEs willing to compete in the market. And again, one of the things that we are constantly trying to improve is the position of SMEs. I want to talk a little bit about the UK government. We've been working with the UK government for about 18 months, two years now. Ever since a new uh, government came in, a new sort of coalition government, their objective initially was to make dramatic cost savings in the provision of public services. Uh, they spent about a, a year analyzing all of their ICT projects and making massive cuts to those projects. They've now moved on from the cutting process to look at a strategy that will actually enable them to further reduce the cost of services and to actually provide more innovative services to the public. And this here is a statement that was actually put out by uh, one of the cabinet ministers which is the first time I've seen in the UK a cabinet minister statement saying things like, create a level playing field for open source software. Impose compulsory standards, starting with interoperability and security. This is new within the UK, new to us, and it's important for us now to follow through these statements and help the government to implement a new regime. Implementing open source strategy is not a simple job. In the UK, there is um, a group of 12 major suppliers that, prov that provide most of the services to UK government. So it's quite a, a monopoly situation. Uh, the government wants to change that. So uh, the government set up three, three groups to try and take these issues forward. The system integrators are basically these 12 big suppliers. There's a forum that's been established with the system integrators to examine why they believe they can't in implement open source and to uh, 
advise them. I was, I was going to say gently, but actually not so gently. <laughs> I was at a meeting of the cabinet office recently, and the CIO of the cabinet office stood up at uh, the system integrators meeting and said, I will expect you all to provide an open source solution to any tender, as well as a proprietary solution. So it's beholden on you all to provide open source alternatives that we can choose. There's an internal cabinet office open source implementation group, which is basically made up of the CIOs of all of the internal departments within, uh, the, within government. Both of these groups said, basically, we don't know enough about open source. We've got to have a way of actually being able to answer questions very quickly and to uh, be advised on how to solve problems. So we've been working, uh, pulling together an advisory panel of, of uh, within the UK, open source, open standards, uh, open licensing specialists who can give quick advice to the implement implementers within these groups. The Cabinet Office recently published a strategy to go along with the government statement. And in that strategy, there was a couple of important statements. One, that uh, government procurement is going to open up with the intention to reduce costs. And a commitment to transparency, and that commitment to transparency is very important when we're actually judging how well they're doing in the future. And the other point, the days of mega IT contracts, I don't know what it's like over here, but we had a, a series of mega IT projects within the National Health Service and within other public services, uh, which were multi-billion projects, totally running out of control, uh, with no possibilities to interface with them with new products that were producing a totally new lock-in environment uh, which was going to create um, a position where the government could not Im implement new competitive technologies to improve the provision of services. So their approach is to move everything onto a smaller, scalable uh, situation. Yep. I won't, uh, I think I've mentioned these all before. Thank you. Are there any questions? Right, okay, Tomislav. to take care that public procurement indeed follows the law rather than uh, Open Forum Europe. Uh, so why is it that they, are they failing? Why is it that they are? And do you have some kind of cooperation with, um, with um, the authorities on uh, making public procurement work? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, we don't see across Europe an appetite for local governments to analyze their public procurements. It's, it's just not happening. Uh, when, in particular, we talked to the UK government about this, and um, they felt that carrying out those sort of analysis themselves can be very dangerous because they can easily drop into the trap of producing analysis which meets their requirements. They liked the idea, and they've asked us to, to work with them, to provide an external oversight so that it's truly independent and no one can be accused of you know, bending the uh, report to fit a particular uh, governmental point of view. So, 
Uh, but there is, the one thing I'll say is there is an overarching EU legislation. Although local governments had some ability to um, control how they implement it, the EU legislation is overarching. And one of the things we're working on at the moment is what the EU can do to improve that legislation. Because I mentioned, we're already seeing a lot of things dropping out of the process, either because it's under the tender, uh, the tender database value, 150,000 euros. So there's no sight of what's going on in that area. Or a move to special procedures, which is pulling tenders out of the process and not, you're not able to analyze them. Under that. So, but we are going to, um, I've been asked actually by the EU in particular to look in more depth. Um, we're actually this year going to move on to a monthly review and to look at uh, individual tenders where we are finding uh, that they don't have descriptions of what they're actually intending to buy or they have trademarks and then raising that immediately with the Commission or with the Parliament so that there can be a follow-up. Previously, all their work has been a year behind. So today, we analyzed 2010. By then, it's too late. <laughs> so now we're going to do it a month <laughs> by month so that it's always up to date. You said that um, you know you looked at some companies which were above the 150,000 threshold, but the, pr the point of Open Forum Europe is, of course, to promote open standards and well, basically open standards and open data across all of Europe. But I was wondering, you also wanted to promote it through SMEs. So, is the next phase of your study possibly going to go into what's happening with the SMEs? I'm not sure, you know, whether they come up in, in over the 150,000 um, threshold or below it, but whatever. There's got to be more insight about them as well and what's working, so. Very much so, because um, you also see a tendency to localization. So uh, a, lo a you know, local organization can be preferred against an another organization from a different country. So we're going to look at those sort of issues. How are SMEs affected by the process and how that, can that be improved? Yeah, uh, is there a list of uh, compulsory uh, standards or guidelines what uh, the tenders should include? I think the tenders should include specification of open standards, definitely. Um, and I think the, the tenders should include, as you say, guidelines on how, um, sorry, let's explain this. Um, <laughs> It's important that the tenders are specific and they have a fun they're functionally, functional specifications as well as uh, the standard specifications. We don't see that. You see generic descriptions of function. Um, so one of the fallouts of that is you get over-specification. So for instance, you know, an example being uh, recent purchases in the UK of office software, generically, um, where if it had been specified at a specific function level, where well, the software was basically for use, uh, clerical use, and the users were only ever going to use a bit of word processing, a very little bit of spreadsheets, and a bit of PowerPoint type stuff. PowerPoint, shouldn't say that. <laughs> Presentation. Um, that could easily have been fulfilled by using a number of different software products. But because it was specified as um, Microsoft Office requirement, it couldn't be responded to because there was no detailed functional specification. Another question? Yeah, one more. Um, have you uh, had any success stories you'd like to point out, uh, instances of procurements where they've uh, 
decisions were overturned and uh, tenders were uh, uh, well republished. Um. And, and if if you have, uh, what are the contributing positive? Well, the factors that allow you to get good results. Mm -hmm. um, I think the simple answer is no. But actually, uh, Jan might want to make a comment about that <laughs> a little later. Um, I think you have to remember that the remedies directive that enabled legal challenge only came in at the very end of 2009. So we're only just beginning to see the effect of that. Um, there are a number of organizations that I've talked to where they feel that they've lost out have been fearful in the past of going through a process of complaining because they fear they may be discriminated against. Um, the EU would like to see examples. They are asking us to do some work in looking at examples and bringing that to their attention. Another reason why we're going to look at current rather than, than uh, year-old tenders. But no, no good examples that I can quote. But uh, so Jan might better quote a bad example. <laughs> uh, one more, perhaps. Uh or if there are no more questions, uh, well, again, applause for Mr. Blatchford. <laughs>